Welcome. I'm Mr. Hammond Beyer. This is the last lecture on 106, Renewable Energy, Alternative and Renewable Energy. Um, so that's what we're about today. What is renewable energy? Renewable energy is nat any naturally occurring, um, theoretically inexhaustible source of energy. So um, rain, wind, tides uh, are all derived things that are not derived from fossil fuels or nuclear fuels. Examples are solar, biomass, wind, hydro, geothermal, and possibly hydrogen. A couple of things. This is a key fact in this particular one. The Earth receives 173,000 terawatts of solar energy every day, continuously. That's more than 10,000 times what we use. Um, uh, the first silicon chip which powered um, uh, devices was built by Bell Laboratories in 1954. Okay, the first satellite uses of solar cells, the Vanguard 1, was the first artificial Earth's um, uh, satellite powered by solar cells. It remains in orbit and is the oldest man-made satellite logging more than 6 billion miles. So it can be done. Also, back in the 1980s, they started what's called the Mojave Desert Solar Thermal Energy Project, or MSP. All right, and once the project was completed, about 350,000 mirrors reflected light onto boilers making steam. The steam turned, turned a turbine, and which generated electricity. There were two fields, each were about 250 megawatts and it cost about $1.6 billion, and it did enter into commercial operation, but this, the first part of it was run by the Department of Energy, and it generates about um, 617,000 megawatts of power annually, or about 88,000 homes. So here's kind of what it looks like. It's an array of basically mirrors that focus incoming sunlight back on a tower, and in the tower, there's either water or salt water, which gets heated up and turned into steam. The steam runs down, and at the bottom, there is a generator, which then is pushed by the steam, which then converts it into electricity. It runs a turbine, which then turns a generator. And you can see there, here are a couple of them laid out in the Mojave Desert. The Mojave Desert is one of the best places for solar radiation in the United States because there's so many days with very, very low clouds, low humidity, and it's relatively far south, so it gets lots of solar radiation. Um, it started in the 1980s, the DOE terminated its part in 1999, and it definitely proved that steam generation um, uh, from solar reflection could be used to generate electricity. And MS2 used salt water rather than regular water, which then retained the heat much later, which allowed them to continue to generate electricity well into the night. Okay, if we look at more conventional solar panels of today, they are, so the sunlight comes in and hits them, and then there has to be some kind of front contact, which is made up of gallium arsenide, um, and that's going to get excited, which is then going to release electrons, which that flow of electrons is electricity. Um, and they reached about 35% efficiency under concentrated sunlight. So if we took them out to the Mojave, they'd probably do really, really well. And there are a number of projects out in the Mojave right now using these. Um, but notice what kinds of chemicals they have in them. Not only do they have gallium arsenide, they also have copper indium diselenide. Okay, there are, throughout this particular lecture, there are a number of DOE videos. I strongly encourage you to stop and take a look at them. They're just short little two or three minute flicks. I'm not going to show them during this part, but they are kind of cool and they will give you some other insight. But this particular one is about an elementary school in North Carolina that where the fifth graders were studying electricity and energy, and they decided to build a solar panel. They um, used a GoFundMe page, they generated enough money, they got the panels, they put it up on their roof, they connected it, they made their room, their classroom totally off the grid. 
this is not rocket science, nor is it particularly difficult to do. How come 90% of the classrooms around the country aren't doing this kind of thing? If you're going to be a teacher, you definitely need to watch this video and consider doing it in your classroom. Okay, some of the pros and cons of solars. Well, the pros are you have all of this energy available, and after the initial cost, um, you have low maintenance, and it's, got, it's going to probably last 20 to 25 years. And you have a continuous flow of energy on a sunny day at relatively no cost after your initial costs are covered up. Now, the cons are on cloudy days, you have storage issues. Therefore, you have to have, um, we proposed this at Davidson, and they said, well, if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to have a lead-lined room to put your batteries in because in case the batteries exploded and you I'm sure you heard a few years ago about some Boeing jets that had battery issues in them and they exploded in the bottom of the planes and they didn't want that around possibility to happen around students so they had to have a lead lined room. Um, you have some problems with heavy metal disposal not only in the panels but in your batteries and your initial cost. So there are some pros and cons. How cheap can we make solar panels and can the cost come down? so that every house throughout the South has one on their roof, there's no excuse for that to not be the situation. Okay, So we look a little bit more at how they're built. So you've got a frame over the top, um, some glass, and then the solar cells themselves, and then some kind of junction box. And so the one we have back in, um, in our garden is basically a panel like this, and it's got to come out of the panel, go into a box, so that you know how much you're getting. And then from there, it's got to go into a storage facility. Well, this is coming out as um, direct current, as DC, and your battery is DC. So in order for you to use it to plug anything in, it's got to go through an inverter, which will then convert it to alternating current, and then you can use it to run your lights or your computers or whatever. OK, next is hydropower. Again, take a look at this video on DOE. Oops. And um, uh, what basically is hydropower? Well, you know, water is flowing and water has mass. And so when it's moving, it has some velocity and therefore some acceleration and therefore some force. Um, and notice all of the dams around the country, that, around the eastern United States, that could be retrofitted with hydroelectric generators. Okay, here in South Carolina on um, the border along the Savannah River, we could have a few up in the upstate. There are a number of few. These are already existing dams that could easily have hydroelectric generators attached to them. This is not making new dams. When I was in Costa Rica, an enterprise, enterprising young guy had taken a little stream coming off of the mountain. We were at about 12,000 feet above sea level, and he took, it was just a little flow, a, a six inch PVC pipe and ran it down the hill, oh, maybe a hundred yards, and it came into a generator which ran um, a turbine, which then went to a battery bank at the hotel, and the, that ran, there were 25 of us staying in that hostel that night, and it ran all the electricity we needed. That's just small scale, and he was totally off the grid. At that point, yes, he had a big drop, but he didn't have a big volume of water. Why aren't we using the flow of water everywhere on small scale? Why make things as big as Clark's Hill, which is way up here, which dammed up the entire Savannah River? Why don't we think small scale, and wherever there's a creek, at least use some of that water to run a turbine and then put it right back in the creek? You're not changing the temperature of the water. You're not altering the flow significantly. You're just using it to generate some electricity. Small scale is a, has a lot more potential. Okay, so with hydropower, you know, it's well established. Um, it does help with flood control. There is a very large long-term investment. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority back in the 30s and 1930s and 40s, invested lots of money to build all these dams. But the advantage is you have consistent production, day or night, of electricity. 
So if you're an electric, electricity manager, you want to have some uh, hydroelectric facilities because you know even in the middle of the night you can get some electricity generated. The big con is you're changing a lodic to a lentic system. So in other words, you have running water and all of a sudden you dam it up and the organisms that live there from an environmental perspective suddenly change. So in other words, rather than mayflies that are clingers and some stoneflies, now all of a sudden you have to bring in different, different types of bugs will habitat that will inhabit that new habitat because you've now slowed down the speed of the water, the types of algae that are there are totally different, all kinds of things change. It does inhibit fish migration. This has been a big um, problem in the Columbia River Basin where the salmon migration has been impacted severely because of all the dams that have been constructed. Here in Augusta, we have an endangered species, the sturgeon, which can't get past the lock and dam in Augusta, so therefore they're gonna take the dam out so the sturgeon can move farther upstream back to some uh, original spawning grounds. We'll see how that works. And the high infrastructure and cost. So not only do you have a lot of initial cost, but you also have to have a pretty big support staff to maintain these large hydroelectric um, plants. Okay, wind power, think about wind turbines. Again, take a minute and take a look at this particular um, video on wind and how it works. But if you drive around parts of the West, you'll find these big wind farms, or the Midwest even, um, big wind farms, and how is this working? Notice how tall these are. This is corn, which is already chest high. So these are way, way up in the air, 160 or 180 feet up. And the blades are very long, but very light. And they will spin uh, basically a shaft, which will then run the turbine, which will then be attached to the generator, which will then send electricity out. Okay. So, a couple of key ideas. The higher above ground you get, the faster the wind speed. So, get these things uh, 80 meters above ground, 100 and 240 feet. Um, tall windmills have, um, are much more efficient and they only have to have eight miles per hour winds to start them moving and they'll run really, really well at 55 miles per hour winds. Now, if the winds get more than that, you're gonna have to have a mechanism to turn them off so that they don't spin too fast and break the mechanism inside. Um, ridges or mountaintops have more wind and if you drive around Maine, my brother in Maine is, is important in licensing wind farms in Maine and he tends to have them on the tops of mountains because as the wind blows through the valley up the hill, it picks up more wind and they're much more efficient. Well, the, the investors would rather have them there. Okay, and usually there are three windmill design, three blade designs. Um, some some states have adopted this quite a bit. For example, Iowa got about 29% of its electricity from windmills. And windmills in the Midwest have a long history because they used to pump water. Now they're not so much pumping water as generating electricity. Um, South Dakota was at 25% and Kansas at 21%. Texas actually generated the most megawatts at 14,000. Um, uh, but it was only 9% of its total electricity. So some states where wind is a very, very big factor are in fact using this technology quite a bit. Um, okay, a couple little pieces of information. A, a blade can be 260 feet long. The industry employs about 70,000 people, which is pretty significant. And um, a third of all the new renewable installations recently have, since 2007, have been with wind power, okay? If we optimized our wind utilization, we could get about 65 gigawatts by um, 2014, and that's about 17 and a half million homes. Wind energy is the cheapest energy right now, um, with about 
2.35 cents per kilowatt hour. If you look at your power bill, you are probably paying anywhere from 9 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. If we were all on wind power, whew, our energy bills could be cut in half. Um, uh, okay, so why isn't everybody on wind? How come we don't use wind more in South Carolina and Georgia? Well, our wind is intermittent, but where's wind the best? Down at the coast. So along the coast, how come there aren't more wind-generated um, facilities? All right, the next one is geothermal. And geothermal is, think about if you, in the middle of the summer, if you go and dig a hole in the ground, it's going to be cool down there. The temperature of the soil doesn't change nearly as fast as the temperature of the air, and it only changes down so far seasonally. Um, and it's usually reflective of the average temperature in an area, the average annual temperature in an area. Okay? So how could we use geothermal energy as a source? Okay, well, where is most of the the easiest geothermal is out west where there are hot springs, and there, there are some hot springs up in North Carolina. If you drive out of Asheville, you'll go past a town called Hot Springs. They can use and are using a little bit of geothermal there, but most of the geothermal is out in the, um, in the Rockies. But here is an interesting idea that makes a heck of a lot of sense. And up in Kent County and Michigan, in northern Michigan, what they did was they went out and drilled a bunch of wells. And instead of sucking water out of the, out of the wells, what they did was put in pipes. And the pipes pump water in and out of the well. So the water goes through all of these wells. And it comes back inside. And in the summertime, that water is cooler than the outside. And so it acts as an air conditioner. In the wintertime, the water is still at 55 or 60 degrees, and so it's much warmer than the outside air, which is below freezing, and so it acts to warm up um, the facility. Now, this is a prison, okay? So they used 96 well system, and they ran the pipes around, and what they found um, was it saved them about $100,000 a year in electricity costs. Over, so they had a 10 year payback. Okay. Now, biofuels are really a hot topic these days. And what are biofuels? Well, take a look at the video, and you'll see that DOE is pretty active in developing biofuels. So, can we take some living matter and process it into energy? Well, if you go to the gas station right now, you'll see it's going to say 10% ethanol. That came from biofuels. But more importantly, can we get algae to make combustible products that we can burn in our cars at some point in time or change our car design so that it will burn some product of algae? And there are a number of those that are out there. Okay. Um, uh, genetic modification here is not much of an issue because you're not feeding these algae to somebody or some organism. You're in fact using them to produce a chemical that um, is going to be used some other way. And um, what they have found is it used to take about $400,000 to make a gallon of fuel. And now they're down to about less than $6 these days. So that's, you know, oil is really cheap right now. But if oil gets up a little more expensive, then that's almost competitive. And so what are they doing? They're basically using grow lights to grow the algae that they have genetically modified or hybridized to produce. And the, one of the products of the, oil, of the algae is oils. And those oils are then separated and then can be purified and burned. Okay. Um, uh, basically, this has to be done by genetically modifying the algae. So we have to take some... DNA from all kinds of things and put it in there and finally get it. So we have biofuel. The next, the big question for the future is hydrogen. Now, will hydrogen um, be the next gasoline? You know, it is the lightest of all known elements. It's 75% of our universe consists of hydrogen. So it's not classically renewable, 
but the supply is amazingly huge and it can be recycled very easily. Um, uh, we don't find pure hydrogen on Earth because it combusts so quickly with oxygen, so it's found mostly as water, um, but it bonds with all kinds of things. So if we look at how much um, uh, fuel is actually, how much energy is in hydrogen in kilowatt hours per kilogram, so as gas, it's got 33, compare that to coal and um, gasoline, which we're at 10 to 13, we're at 33 kilowatt hours per kilogram, whereas liquid hydrogen is about the same, and see gasoline and diesel are down at 12 or 13 or so. So we're two to three times more, two and a half times more energy per kilogram. Now a kilogram of hydrogen is not the same as a kilogram of gasoline. How can we produce it? Well, we can do electrolysis, so we can in fact run electricity through water with some platinum um, capacitor ion, anodes and cathodes, and the water will separate into hydrogen will go to one side, oxygen will go to the other side. Okay. That requires a lot of electricity. Could we possibly do this? Um, uh, see, so we're going H2O goes to H2 plus O2. All right, and it requires a catalyst and a current. Mm. There are, it's pretty energy intensive to do it that way. Is there another way we could do it either with um, uh, wind or solar? Now, the, but then once we have separated this hydrogen, the problem is, what are we going to do about storing it? Are we going to put it in big containers like our gas cylinders um, for natural gas? We could compress it, we could cool it and make it liquid, or some of the new technology is putting it in nanotubes so there's not enough of it close, so close to each other that it can combust. But think about, you know how combustible gasoline is. Well, think of something that's three times more combustible than that. Somebody's lighting a cigarette while they're refilling their hydrogen car the whole city block could blow up. So there has to be some other mechanism of delivery if we're going to have hydrogen stations like we have gas stations. Uh, we're going to have to re-engineer this to make it much safer. And how are we going to distribute it? You know, you don't want a hydrogen tank driving down the road to have an accident blowing a hole 50 feet deep in the road because of that. Um, uh, so so there has to be some method of distribution and on both a mass scale and a, a more localized. And then how are you going to get it into your car and how are you going to keep it safe? And think about it, if you had a hydrogen car, what are you doing? You're putting hydrogen in and bringing oxygen out of the atmosphere. What's going to be coming out of your tailpipe? Not gas, but water. Well, could we use that water again, run it through electrolysis and split it back into the hydrogen and the oxygen? How could that possibly happen? Okay, so there are some fuel cell vehicles that use hydrogen gas. Um, uh, and basically what they're doing is running a generator, which then makes an electric current, which then um, uh, basically it's an electric car. So they're using hydrogen to generate the electricity to run the car. But there are also internal combustion engines that are using hydrogen as um, uh, similar to, to our car from today, use hydrogen as liquid hydrogen as the, as the source of fuel rather than gasoline. Okay, so we got fuel storage and pressures and temperatures, refueling, public awareness and economics are part of the problems, but BMW and uh, Mercedes have both designed and built prototype cars that run on hydrogen. So it's out there. It's not, you can't go out and buy one of these, but soon. There are just some uh, logistical problems. So is it the next generation of fuels? It's viable. It has very, very low emissions. It will not increase our, our um, global warming issues. And um, it's a great power source, three times more powerful than gasoline. There are certainly some logistics things to solve, but you guys are bright. Figure it out. Could this be the future? Go make a whole bunch of money. And there are a couple of extra video clips in here and some sources. Okay, that ends this lecture. 
I hope you've enjoyed the class, and I will see you at some point in the future.